Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, it, welcome to this evening. Um, and we're going to talk, Victoria's going to talk today about what it takes to aid in a crisis. So, my name's Dr. Adele McCormick. I'm a senior lecturer at the Department of Biomedical Sciences. And Victoria, she was um, an alumna from University of Westminster in 2011, where she did an MSc. And now she's in St. George's Hospital as a senior um, biomedical scientist. So Victoria is going to talk about her experience when she got deployed to Sierra Leone in 2015 um, as part of the UK government's approach to tackle the Ebola outbreak. And she was one of several um, biomedical scientists who were um, deployed to Sierra Leone um, who achieved the Queen's Ebola Medal Award <laughs> for the work she did. So um, I'd like you to um, uh, welcome Victoria and she will tell you all about her experience in Sierra Leone. Thank you. Good evening. It's a lot of people. <laughs> so I'm going to start telling you a little bit about... Forward? Yep. Mm. I can press the button. <laughs> Love technology. Uh, so about how I got into biomedical science. So I decided when I was doing my A-levels that I didn't really want to go to university. So I found a laboratory in Oxford and I phoned up the lab manager and asked if I could come and do some work experience. Thankfully he said yes and I did a week in my upper sixth form commuting to Oxford to file samples and learn a bit about histology. Six weeks later they sent me an application form and I applied for and then got a four-year trainee BMS post. So I have been in the NHS as a biomedical scientist since I was 18. And I did a part-time, so the four-year course involved six-month rotations through microbiology, cellular pathology, hematology, biochemistry, and immunology, with a further 18 months in my chosen discipline, as well as a fully funded part-time BSc in applied biomedical science. So I actually did my first year here at Westminster, and then I transferred to Oxford Brooks for the final three years. At the end of that four years, we'd had the 2008 recession, and there was no money in the NHS. So I took a year out, and I came to Westminster to do an MSc in biomedical science. After that, I was quite lucky, and I managed to secure a band six, which is a specialist biomedical scientist post in immunology up in Liverpool, at the Royal Liverpool Hospital covering a long-term sick. So I did that for a year. And then I applied for the scientist training program, the STP. And I did that for a year down in microbiology in Oxford. But while I was there, one of the positions I really wanted actually came up. So I, well, <laughs> the position had actually already closed at Imperial, at Charing Cross Hospital. So I phoned up the lab manager and told her that I know it had closed. And I know that I didn't have my specialist diploma, but these were all the reasons why I really felt she should hire me anyway. And thankfully, she took my CV and I did get an interview and I did actually get that job. And I was there for nearly four years. During that time, I took, there was this comment to Sierra Leone with a PhD. And I took on another second job as a private tutor. And then last two years ago, 2016, I applied for a band seven special senior position down at St. George's Hospital, which is where I am now. So I'll just talk a little bit about Ebola virus disease, because I don't know who knows what exactly. So it's a suspected carrier... Uh, so terabodidae bats are the suspected carriers. <laughs> it's a... So the virus is asymptomatic in the bats, but they carry live, live virus in their body fluids, which is how it can be transferred into humans. It causes viral hemorrhagic disease in humans and primates. First case was in Zaire, which is now the DRC, back in 1976. Symptoms are fever, muscle pain, headache, DMV, rashes, hiccups, which is actually a useful telling point that it's Ebola virus, not any of the other diseases out there that will cause most of similar symptoms like malaria. And the mortality rate does often exceed 50%. So this is just a summary of all the Ebola outbreaks in humans. 
since 1976 up to but not including the West African outbreak. As you, the main take points are that it doesn't tend to spread, or three, the West African outbreak, it hadn't tended to spread, outbreaks tended to be quite small and would generally burn out quite often with a fairly high rate of mortality. So like the DRC outbreak in 2007, 71% fatality rate, even up as high as 90% in some of them. And what you tend to find is that a lot of the outbreaks are associated with bat migration. So the 2015, 13 to 15 West African outbreak was not the only Ebola outbreak in Africa at the time. There was also an outbreak in the DRC, which was related to the same bat migration. However, that one did burn itself out much quicker. So the West African outbreak actually started back in late 2013. It was a two-year-old boy in Gwekadu in Guinea. His father was a bat catcher. They were sold for food, and he was playing with one of the bats. Unfortunately, he passed away, and so did most of his family. It spread very quickly through West Africa in a way that Ebola never had before. Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone don't have borders in the way that a lot of countries see borders. They're very much a political standing so people will very quickly move across. The West African culture is very touchy-feely, and one of the main reasons that it spread so quickly was that they have very specific funeral rituals, and that will often involve the entire family or the village washing the body, and then saying their goodbyes to it that way. At this point, the body is often teeming with virus, and it would cause infections in most of those present. Beyond West Africa, there were cases in Italy, Mali, Nigeria, Senegal, Spain, the UK, and the USA. These are all cases that presented in that country rather than aid workers who have flown back. So in the UK, we had Pauline Kafaki, who presented once she'd arrived back in the UK. Nearly 30,000 cases, much higher than anything we'd had previously, and 11,000 confirmed fatalities. These numbers could well be a lot higher a lot of people died, not necessarily tested. The outbreak went on until March 2016, and there were still cases until June, July 2016. It's not playing with me. So, even though the first case was November 2013, it didn't hit the international radar until March 2014, was actually a doctor who noticed that some of the patients were presenting with hiccups and suspected Ebola, and samples were sent over to Europe. Ebola was confirmed about a week later. The Médecins Sans Frontières Centre in McKenney, which is up in the Bombali district here, was converted to an Ebola treatment centre, which was the first one. Staff were deployed in March, so by this point, the international response was kicking up. By mid-2014, they'd managed to secure 50 Ebola treatment centres across the three countries. And this gives a rough guide of where they were. So there were not many out in Guinea, partly because Guinea is really quite dangerous. <laughs> so the UK international response was mostly based in Sierra Leone. So of the three countries, they were m it was a huge international effort. But the UK led the response in Sierra Leone, the response in Guinea was led by France, and the response in Liberia was led by the USA. So the UK mostly pledged our funding to Sierra Leone. By the beginning of 2015, we were supporting 882 beds across the country, which is a lot. These are not, they are very expensive to maintain this sort of treatment. It's not quite the same as having bays in a standard hospital ward. You have to keep all your patients separate. And the way that the treatment centre will work is the doctors have to be up in that gear that you full white coverage that you see on TV, and they can only do that for 45 minutes at a time. Uh, so Public Health England, which is where a lot of the UK's response went, coordinated with three NGOs. So in the western rural area near Freetown, was a Save the Children based site, which is also where the MOD was housed. McKenney, which is where the first treatment centre was set up, ran with the International Medical Corps. 
and Port Loco, which is where I was deployed, was run part by Goal and part by the Danish Emergency Med Management Agency. Laboratory-wise, the government put out a call for <coughs> laboratory volunteers some point mid to end 2014. The original plan was that the Public Health England would fully support the laboratories with their own staff, but they failed to get enough volunteers. So they stuck out this on the government website. They wanted Category 2 experience, so I don't know how much is taught at university, but there are four categories of pathogen. So we, Ebola is Category 4. In this country, there are only two Category 4 labs, one at Collindale and one at Porton Down in Salisbury. So they were unlikely to get people with Category 4 experience. Ideally, they wanted PCR experience because that's how they were testing for Ebola. But you could get away without it. They were advertising for five-week deployments, but ideally they would have you out longer. The post, your post in the UK was backfilled, and they would cover the cost of a locum. So it was a long process. So the first thing was a standard job application form with a reference from your employer. So I went to my boss and told her what I wanted to do, and she was very supportive, which is great, but she did point out that her first commitment is to her department here. So she needed confirmation that she would have somebody to cover me. As it worked out quite well, there was someone whose contract was ending who could cover another member of staff for the six-week period to go out and then have two weeks off and then cover me so they didn't need to train anybody. So she was happy to write the reference, which is good. There's a full health screen. There's an in-depth health screen along with an hour psychological evaluation on via Skype with a psychiatrist in Nairobi. We did a stay safe training course, which is what they give to all aid workers, which involves such wonderful scenarios such as what to do if you're in a room and someone throws a grenade through the window. Uh, that I never had to use, thankfully. Lots of vaccinations. Any vac basically, any vaccination that was available, I had to prove that I'd got already or I had to have it. So we had the rabies course, yellow fever, anti-malarials, cholera vaccine and the seasonal influenza vaccine. And we then did a week's training course at Porton Down in Salisbury, which is the main Public Health England base, in novel and dangerous pathogens, where they gave us a background to category four work. They had a mock-up of one of the treatment centers. And then we, at the end of the week, we did a full day in character with all the heating turned up and everything that could go wrong went wrong. And then we had an exam at the end. And if you didn't pass that, you didn't go any further. <coughs> then there was a visa application because uh, you need a business visa to go into Sierra Leone, although they did waive the fee. And then you were assigned to a team as sort of flight dates. This was a long procedure, and I was actually almost knocked out of it twice based on medical grounds. I'm asthmatic. They weren't fond of that. Oops. And... I have food allergies, and they were very worried that I'd either starve or would struggle to get medical help if I needed it. So I was part of the April 2015 deployment. By this point in Sierra Leone, there had been 25,000 cases. So if you think back to that there were 28,000 confirmed total, this is towards the end of the outbreak after the big hump of it. Liberia had had its last new case on March 20th. You, this was a big deal because once you've had a case, the last case has either passed away or been cleared of Ebola, they have a countdown, which is 42 days, which is twice the maximum length of the Ebola incubation period. If you have had 42 days without cases, you were declared Ebola free, and Liberia were on this 42-day countdown, which unfortunately they did actually miss and started again. The UK had had its 42-day countdown passed after Pauline Kafaki had recovered, so we were free. The care, because they were lowering cases and also because Save the Children had run out of funding, the Kerry Town Lab, which was based here in the capital, was, had been put on standby. So all of that work had come up to Port Loco. I like this. So I arrived in Sierra Leone very early in the morning, April. There were no longer direct flights to Sierra Leone, so you had to go via Brussels and Senegal. 
And when you got there, it was a stark change in experience. So there are no runway, there's no gates. You just get off the plane and walk to the single terminal. And it, so began the hand washing. So before entering or leaving any building in Sierra Leone during this period, you had to wash your hands. We actually got to the point where if you were going to the toilet from the lab, I had seven hand washes between leaving the lab, going to the toilet and coming back in. You were temperature checked with these truly god awful laser temperature checkers that the locals had outside. So there's a picture of this one at Longy Airport in Freetown. I came up at various points between 27 degrees and 39 degrees, which most of you will know is dead. <laughs> so they weren't really bothered by a low result, and they didn't have the training to necessarily understand that a temperature of 30 degrees was just not valid in any way. But if it beeped and it was over 37, then they started to panic. Uh, first thing they would do is make you go sit in the shade and hope that you would cool down so they didn't have to do anything else. When you got into Lungi, they were having a screen, health screen, and they checked everybody through. And as long as you passed and they were happy with all your documents, then you could get back. I had the slight issue that my visa did not cover my full five weeks in Sierra Leone. And it turned out that I was the first person in six months who actually refused to try and uh, bribe my way back out at the airport and insisted that somebody went to Freetown and actually had my visa legally extended. So this is where we were staying. This is the uh, tents. It was actually really comfortable. It doesn't look it, but it was. This was my home for five weeks. And these were run by the Danish Emergency Management Agency. So they had air conditioning. It was the only place in Sierra Leone that I had air conditioning. And it had Wi-Fi, which was wonderful. Uh, particularly as when I arrived, communication is not always great. And the people who'd booked my flights had not actually told the people out in Sierra Leone I was coming. Because I'd taken someone's slot who'd been knocked off for various reasons. And I then had to hitchhike from the airport. And this is about three hours, randomly jumping into a stranger's van. And then I got to there, and they hadn't got me on their list. So because I was in the middle of a field in the middle of West Africa, and I was very white for being in the middle of a field in West Africa, the guy just kind of went, I'm just going to give you a tent and we'll worry about it tomorrow. So I had Wi-Fi and I could actually get hold of the PHE, who refused to give me a phone number when I, before I left because, no, it's fine, I'll meet you at the airport. And I managed to contact a Danish friend who actually got someone to come find me. Uh, so this is a mock-up or map of the Ebola Treatment Centre. So the Treatment Centre was split into three zones. The white zone, the green zone, and the red zone. And the red zone, which was here, was the wards. Nobody entered the red zone without full PPE, and could only be, uh, non patients could only be in there for 45 minutes. This was predominantly tense, and you're looking at 40 to 45 degrees with 90% humidity, covered from head to foot in plastic. It's actually quite dangerous if you're in there any longer. And everyone who came out had a long, decontamination process, so they would be sprayed down with chlorine, take off one layer, spray down with chlorine, take off the next layer, and there would be someone shouting instructions at you because by that point your brain had fried. I never had to do this, thankfully. Outside the red zone was the green zone, which is where we were. So that was here because we had a direct link to the red zone so samples could come out without having to be transported. But this bit here, the change zone rooms, locked between the white zone and the green zone. Nothing apart from yourself, and this included all your clothes and all your belongings, could go from the white zone to the green zone. You had to fully change. And all of our clothes were stored in here. And we got in. I had the great fun that my first moment in, my first day at the treatment centre, I actually tripped out of the bus and into a ditch and scraped my whole leg open and so I walked into the treatment centre with blood dripping down and got yelled at by one of the doctors. Uh, there were 100 beds. So there were lots of things all over the news about the fact that we had 300 beds and that they were only had three or four patients in them. That's because the attempt was to scale them up slowly. You don't want to let 100 people in and find out that all your processes have failed, that your PPE is not working, and that you've infected another 100 people. So 
it was a slow scale up process, but when they were full, they did work. So we served the Port Loco district, the Cambia district, which bordered with Guinea, and the Western Urban District since the Kerry Town shut down. So even though this was the end of the outbreak, it was still quite busy. So this was an outlook. So this was our way to the laboratory. Most of it was outside. We had the only building. Everything else was tents. And we would walk through. It was quite interesting at night time. There were snakes. And this was our lab, which is, uh, it was hot. So sample reception. So for anyone who's been to a pathology lab, this is a little bit smaller. So this one was our window to the red zone. Samples came, just opened, came through. We kept this locked to all of the points. And we received samples from the community. So anybody who died in Sierra Leone during this period had a swab taken and was brought to one of the treatment centers for testing. It was just because someone had died not from Ebola didn't mean they didn't die with Ebola. So my last week there, we had a mother who died in childbirth, came up positive for Ebola. Childbirth in Sierra Leone is a very much all the women in the village experience. Childbirth is obviously full of a lot of blood. Unfortunately, Ebola crosses the placenta, so the baby died a couple of weeks later. And it, it sparked an outbreak in that village. The really sad story with that one is that the grandmother volunteered to look after the baby. And unfortunately, I left before I found out whether or not she survived. So we would get samples in through here from all the drivers. Samples always arrived in three levels of containment. So your first level is the tube it's in. And then they would ideally come in a plastic sealed bag and then into a plastic container. And the plastic container would go straight into this bucket here, which was full of 10,000 parts per million chlorine. And it stayed there for 20 minutes, so that anything on the outside would be killed. And then we would take it into the isolator and open it up, but we would go no further than that until it had been inactivated. So yeah, three levels, or oh, 5,000. It's been three years. Uh, so we would confirm details with the driver, we'd fill out paperwork, and we would take photos of all of this with an iPad. And this was because all these pieces of paper carried an infection risk, so they went straight in the bin. We had a massive whiteboard, which I unfortunately couldn't take photos of because it had patient data on it, where we would keep a track of all the batches that had come in and what <coughs> stage they were at and who was dealing with them. And then we kept a database because unlike out here, we didn't have a limb system. So this is how we did the inactivation. We couldn't have a full Category 4 laboratory, so we did everything in an isolator. You're actually wear, wearing, at this point, four pairs of gloves. And I know done a lot of laboratory work, but that really affects the mobility of your fingers. So we wore gloves at any point in the laboratory, as soon as you stepped in the door. As soon as you did anything that handled samples, inactivated or not, second pair of gloves. Put your hands into the isolator, and you've got your third pair of gloves here, which were washing up gloves. And then you put an extra pair of gloves on top. We inactivated everything, cleaned every layer. Viral transport medium, we diluted one in four, and we separated any blood, so we got blood from the inpatients. We inactivated everything by lysis buffer and by ethanol for two methods. Massive overkill, but we try not to hurt ourselves as well. Once that had been done, we could take it out of the isolator, and then it was categorized as category two, and we were safe on the bench. So we then went to PCR, manual and automated. So we, had, we did have specific rooms for the master mix. And the lab was 33 degrees with the air conditioning on. It was up to 40 degrees in these rooms. And we shared lab coats in those rooms. It was disgusting. <laughs> so we also did, we didn't just do the Ebola testing. We did basic hemochromatic. Uh, biochemistry and hematology, so your full blood counts, your use and ease, your glucose levels. We did point of care testing, which is what this is, for malaria, because we were coming into the wet season. Malaria is very prevalent around West Africa, and it has very similar symptoms to Ebola. So what you ended up with was potentially people coming into the treatment center with malaria, but leaving with Ebola. So we were trying to avoid that. 
with a lot of new trials going on. We did a lot of work for various research groups, vaccine groups, drugs companies who were very interested in what was going on. We were in the process when I left trying to bring in HIV point of care testing because HIV is incredibly prevalent in Sierra Leone and also PCR for dengue, Lassa and cholera which were coming up during the wet season and we were trying to find reasons for funding to keep the laboratory going after we left. So, so trials working you see, so temperature regulation, resourcefulness, so in the UK if I want to order something I stick in an order, I get my boss to approve it, I phone the company, it should be there within 48 to 72 hours. That's not what happens here. Once you've got it into, you had to think two to three months ahead even though you wouldn't be here in three months. You had to work around everything, we had sample issues, so in the UK we would always only deal with samples that had three unique identifiers. You want name, date of birth and ideally a hospital number or NHS number. There were very few surnames in Sierra Leone, so you would quite often get ten samples in a batch and three of them would have, the, four or five of them would have the same surname and three of them would have the same first name. They wouldn't necessarily have age because they don't use a calendar necessarily like ours and a lot of them would not be labelled at all. So the process we went with, because these were dead bodies and we couldn't get them back, is we processed everything, regardless. If it was all negative, we just signed it off as negative. If it was positive, then we had a problem, we had to go back. We trained up some local staff, so the idea here was a legacy program. We didn't want to have to come back if there was another outbreak. So we had some staff from the local hospitals who were great. And we taught them how to do PCR because they'd never done it before. And there was dust everywhere. We were the only lab that did not have a lino floor. We had this dust thing and by far the best thing I learned to clean it with was these like bunch of sticks that we bought from the local market. And we had a lot of wildlife in the lab. Mice, rats, snakes, uh, couple of very large spiders that one of the locals thought was really funny that all of the white people were carrying from. In my defense, I had no idea whether it could hurt me. As soon as I knew it couldn't hurt me, that was fine. Then I got rid of it. So there is still an impact of Ebola out in Sierra Leone. There are no new, new cases, but there are neurological issues associated with Ebola, which we are now only beginning to find because in the cases pre-2013, you weren't having the same level of issue, weren't number of survivors. Their healthcare system was destroyed. They didn't have anything like the capacity to deal with this. When we went to the we went to Port Loco City Hospital to visit the scientists we had trained, they couldn't even afford the chlorine. We were washing hands with soap that you were sharing with the 50 people in front of you. We messed about with quite a lot of their local traditions. People were no longer allowed to do the burial traditions that they wanted to do. Was a case, um, people were trying to avoid this, so we ended up with a case where a family had lost their daughter and they'd shoved the body in a well just so that they wouldn't have the body taken away. Thankfully, it was not positive for Ebola. Uh, there was a stigma. So we ended up with a lot of people coming to the treatment centre who just needed a negative Ebola certificate before they could have any kind of testing. And then a lot of people who went home weren't wanted by their families. They were, people were worried, they didn't understand that they were now immune. And there was a re-emergence of the virus. There were people who had previously been negative but came back positive. And we did see that in Pauline Kafki as well. She was never quite... So we don't know whether or not this is going to be an ongoing problem. It's hard to know. So what does it take to aid in a crisis? Firstly, you need to have some kind of skills and experience that they want. So in my case, I had PCR experience, which, and I was prepared to go, which was not as un, which was quite unusual. You've got to really want it. I was knocked out of the system at two spaces. I had to find my own cover back home. I got knocked off the Kerry Town team because Save the Children lost all their funding, and then I just phoned up and went, when can I go? I'm still here. Love me. You have to be committed to it. It's, and be flexible. So I had my dates changed three or four times. I ended up, while you're out there, things do not run smoothly in Sierra Leone. We ended up with, there, I'm trying to think of an example. We had the lud flooded with, flooded with chlorine gas one evening, that was fun. Uh, 
you had to learn to react to whatever was happening. And there was a lot of emotional resilience. You saw a lot of things that you wouldn't see here. There was a the case I discussed earlier. We had a teenage girl come to the hospital with her father who we discovered had a glucose level through the roof and we actually ended up tentatively diagnosing as type 1 diabetic. There was no insulin in Port Loco. It's a three hour drive and you have to buy it. And the average salary in Sierra Leone is one US dollar a day. And we basically sent her home to die with a condition that is so easily treatable here. And in some ways that's a lot harder than dealing with anything like Ebola, which even in the UK would carry a fairly high fatality risk. And that's it, I think, was the end of... So, yeah. <coughs> I'm going to sit down with the lady. So thank you, Victoria, for such an informative and inspirational talk. Um, we got a real feel of the experience <laughs> that you went through. Um, obviously, not the, you know, yeah. the, the spiders and, <laughs> and um, But thank you so much for that. And I'm sure a lot of the um, students here um, who would like to get into the volunteering process um, would be, you know, would like to talk to you after this talk. So I'm sure we've got lots of questions. So if you have a question to ask Victoria, can you put your hand up? Um, say what your course is um, and when you graduated or if you're studying now um, and then Victoria can answer your questions. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for doing this. That's really interesting. In fact, I'm doing international relations and development and mm -hmm. I'm hopefully going to specialise in post-conflict countries. Yeah. So that's why I'm here. I'm kind of ready in like two and a half years. Mm. It's Probably a very stupid question, but how did you tell your parents that you've done this? Because this is what I'm currently doing, and I have to deal with so much like resistance. How did you manage this? Well, I applied without telling them, which was always a good start. And then I had I have someone in my workplace, and I she saw me do it, and she said, "Oh, we should do it. We should talk to our boss." I'm like, "Oh, wait, I'm just going to apply. I'll deal with that later." And then. So I was actually due to get married three months after I got back. Did successfully, it's fine. But I sort of went home and, by the way, honey, um, I'm going to go to Sierra Leone and work on a bowler. You don't mind, do you? Uh, he was very supportive. With my parents, I kind of cheated it. So a friend of mine was actually out there when the Ebola outbreak started, working on cholera. And she did an interview with the IBMS Gazette. And it was beautiful things. And she was interviewed on ITV. And then she went back out again as a team leader. As my parents and my grandmother in particular had heard about this. I'm like, look, here's Chloe. Look at Chloe. Look, she went out and she came back. And she went out and she came back. And my grandmother just looked at me and she went, you're not doing that. It's like, oh, well, actually. <laughs> they got to it. They weren't happy, I can tell you that. But I think eventually my father, who wasn't happy about it from the get-go, stood up at my wedding and made a speech about how wonderful it was. So eventually, I think they come round. But they come round much easier if you come home safe. I think, and also don't tell them everything goes on. There's rather large chunks of what went on that my mother doesn't need to know. <laughs> Any more questions? Hello. Sorry. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm just visiting. I don't actually. I haven't attended this <laughs> university. Um, my question was about the legacy projects. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask how successful that is, um, taking into consideration that you know we are in an age where you have a lot of emerging and re-emerging you know, diseases. If you look at Madagascar, for example, the plague, um, which was spreading into the whole of Southern Africa, and you know it caused a big uproar. Um, you know, how successful were you training you know, local people? Um, and what do you think is lacking in terms of actually you know, giving them the tools that they need to be dealing with such things. So the legacy program actually pulled out at Christmas. So it's been there a long time. A friend of mine actually runs it. So I do actually know this question. <laughs> so Port Loco ETC has actually been left to rot, which is actually quite sad. So Gold, the Danish pulled out while I was there. They all packed up and went off. And Gold have pulled out now as well, even though they were already based in Sierra Leone. So what happened is there was, it's called the Resilience Zero program from Public Health England, and it was out there in several points around Sierra Leone, and they really pushed on the legacy training. So they had originally UK staff out there, and then the idea was that they would hand it over. So by the end, the UK staff were actually being paid to not do anything, basically, and they would just supervise. And the idea was this was a sort of two-year project where they would spend a lot of time learning because 
you can't learn everything you need to know about running a laboratory in six weeks. It's not possible. So, so far it's successful. They are now running, so they're attempting to set up another register. So what they currently have is an emergency medical deployment register, but they're predominantly for medics and nurses and pharmacists who are ready to go out, but they don't really have anything for scientists. And they're in, they, they did get one for the Ebola register, but they're trying to set that up more long term, particularly for people with a microbiology background, because at the moment they predominantly recruit haematologists and biochemists, and they only take people with experience, which you can't get if you're not a haematologist or biochemist. So the idea is now they're trying to pull in people who've already been. Basically, with Sierra Leone, they scrape the bottom of the barrel, which is harsh, but true, and it's the only way I got in. It wasn't the first time I'd applied to go abroad into a disaster area. It was the first time I got, got there. So hopefully it's... As for the finance, uh, the, is the big thing that's lacking. It's money. And as you said, there's a lot of other conditions in a lot of other countries. There's a lot of people here who are struggling. There's only so much money to go around. And I suspect when it comes to budgets and politicians, winning votes here is more important than appeasing people in West Africa, <laughs> unfortunately. Oh, sorry, just sorry. Do you want to? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, Victoria, hi, my name's Jim. Um, that was really interesting, so thanks very much for that. Um, so I'm doing a part-time MBA at the moment, yeah. and uh, one of the modules that we do is uh, it's called Space for Risk, and uh, encourages us to do things out of our comfort zone, which includes things like volunteering, uh, different kinds of volunteering. Um, I'm just wondering, actually, um, before you did this, was there any sort of other kind of volunteering that you actually did? And have you got any, any plans to do any other form of volunteering going forward? I've always done volunteering. I've always been a big believer in helping other people. I've never done volunteering on this scale. I was a girl guide leader for 10 years, which is not quite the same, same thing. Uh, and I used to volunteer for a company that runs sci-fi conventions, of all things, uh, also for about five or six years. But no, I would do it again. I would go out in a heartbeat if it, it comes down to the family again. You, it's, it's not just about you. They worry. They, I, I'm married to a police officer. I understand what it's like to worry about someone when they're at work. I don't want to put that on my family. My grandmother's nearly 90. You know, I'll give her a heart attack if I keep going back out places. <laughs> Maybe in a few years. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, I was wondering about the sort of disease burden you saw uh, apart from Ebola. So, so things like hepatitis and other ongoing diseases, because obviously their other healthcare system had failed. Um, did you see a lot of people reaching out to the Ebola centers for those diseases? No. So. <laughs> People did not like the Ebola centers. A lot of people were literally dragged in kicking and screaming. They, there was a strong belief, particularly in the rural areas of Sierra Leone, that the Ebola virus was brought in by the West. And that it was, particularly where I was, there were a lot of kids who'd never seen a white person or an Asian person and who used to scream at them. <laughs> they used to shout Apute, which is Temne or Creole for white person or foreigner. And there was a guy on our, who worked for Gold who was Sudanese and had never left Africa in his life, and used to get quite worked up by it, because they called him white as well. He's um, <laughs> like, I'm African. I'm like, well, you're not as dark as them, are you? Uh, which was very funny. Uh, they did, when I got there, the, the doctor who, looked, who did the health check when I got there, who was from Sierra Leone, although I did turn around, I was like, yeah, but where in London do you live? Uh, was, he said, oh, when you start tanning, they'll stop calling you white person. Like, no. I will never be dark enough for them not to call me a white person. But they, so they came, there was disease, but they wouldn't have come to us. They, they swarmed to the hospitals. So I did get to go to Connaught Hospital in Freetown, which did make the news a few times, which is predominantly sponsored by Tony Blair. And they love Tony Blair in Sierra Leone. Like, you walk around Freetown and you can see his face on people's T-shirts. Uh, they, they love him to bits. It's very odd. And... So he, we went there, and that's where there's a lot of strain. So the Sierra Leone government does actually pay 
for a lot of testing. So the malaria testing was funded by the Sierra Leone government. Hepatitis B testing is paid for, but obviously not the drugs. And hepatitis B is a particular one is a lot of people infected at childhood, which gives you, what, the 90% chance of chronic hep B. It's not. That's where they were struggling. And a lot of their money had gone through the Ebola. And a lot of deaths. A lot of healthcare professionals died. When I was there, they were down to one consultant surgeon left in the whole country who had not died of Ebola. So that's where they're going to struggle, because they need that training and that knowledge that they've lost. Is that called off, called off toilets? Hmm? Hepatitis B, you get it from security toilets. <laughs> not really. Oh, I, you, no, I had a friend, well, I don't know about a friend, but he <laughs> called hepatitis. I don't know what type, but he was very ill. And uh, I don't know, it's just something I sort of uh, assumed, you know, <laughs> well, you can catch a lot of dirty toilets. Uh, so a blood-borne virus, hepatitis B. So hepatitis A and E are fecal oral, so you can catch those from toilets. Okay. Yeah. Because he, he, he was very ill and then something threw a brick, you know. <laughs> he had to have his head stitched up and stuff. But uh, he got better, hopefully. Okay, I think this gentleman wants to ask a question. Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> um, Ibrahim, I'm studying here, but I'm studying law, not medicine. But I am from Sierra Leone. Oh. Um, I was there um, during the Ebola outbreak um, from the north, oh. just beyond uh, Makeni from Kabala. I liked Makeni. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, we're still struggling to, mm -hmm. um, to know the cause, the root cause of the Ebola. And your presentation shows that um, the bat, um, as a carrier, is just a suspect. Mm and that um, Ebola, Ebola, the Ebola virus itself originates from um, the Great Lakes region, mm. so hence the name the Ebola virus. And um, this is one of the reasons why um, it spread across the three countries, because people um, couldn't um, understand mm. um, why Ebola, because um, there were three theories, um, if I'm not mistaken, so one, was that um, CDC um, was in Guinea, and mm. then the outbreak um, happened in Guinea. And um, the other theory was um, Sierra Leone was very close to um, presidential election, and mm. that it was applied <laughs> um, by the government to, to um, um, get rid of the opposition party. Mm -hmm. And that's why people were not following instructions. And um, my interest is um, the suspected but mm. as carrier, um, has that been confirmed? If not, and um, what, what could be the explanation um, between Ebola being um, origin from the great, great Rakes mm. region and, and Sierra Leone? Thank you. So they are f almost certain that it comes from those bats. The main issue is what they've not done yet is isolated live Ebola virus in the bat saliva, which is what they need to do in order to confirm. So with Marburg, which is a cousin virus to Ebola, they have confirmed that as a bat species of three particular bats. I'm hoping it's one of those that Ebola had very little funding and interest, sad as it is, from the drugs companies pre the West African outbreak, because it was mostly confined from a drug company point of view to countries that don't have a lot of money. And I've the cynical part of me thinks that the big rush to produce an Ebola vaccine was partly due to the wonderful publicity they got from doing it, not from any real sense of helping. But I think they're fairly certain that it's from the bats. I haven't actually checked whether or not they've confirmed it. I probably should do that and update my talk. Um, Victoria, can I ask you a quick question? Mm -hmm. um, because some of the students here, they get to do PCR and their practicals mm. as undergraduate. How much experience do they need in that field and how much experience did you get before you went out? Did you go to Port and Down for training? Can you just give a little bit of an insight into that, please? So I had worked for several years in microbiology and virology, so I had a lot of experience with automated PCR. Very little experience with manual PCR, which is what we did a lot of in Sierra Leone, partly because our automated analyzers broke down with the chlorine gas leak. Uh, so we did, I, the, the only fully manual PCR I'd actually done was here, is one of our practicals, but it's still the basic process. 
Personally, I would say if you want to go out and do something like this, I would get some fairly in-depth experience first because you've got a lot of things being thrown at you. You've got rat, potentially mice under your feet and it's hot and it's sweaty and it's, you've got doctors yelling at you because someone's potentially dying and they want to know why. <coughs> it's good to really know what it is that you're doing first. <coughs> the isolators were a whole new process to me. I've done category three work, but category three work is still is more about the room being negatively pressured rather than anything you do. And I've, you had to go back to beginning a lot. So what you find in microbiology is if you're opening blood tubes, you quite often you use two fingers, like a toothpaste tube, lift it off, stick, not allowed in an isolator. You have to do everything from scratch. So you pick very carefully, put your lids down this way. And it's almost like going back to the beginning as a first year undergrad again. But the idea is if you do it slow, you do it controlled, you do it carefully, you are less likely to knock something over because what you really don't want to do is knock three mils of potentially Ebola virus contaminated transport medium all over your isolator because that will bring that isolator down and it have to be fully decontaminated before you can start again. And you could risk the rest of your batch, which is another problem. And it's really hard to clean those isolators because you've got four players of gloves on. And if you... In order to bring anything into the isolator, you had to clean all of the walls and the inside of the door. And then they had a little compartment and you opened that door and you put things in and then to clean the outside. And it was a whole long faff of like 10 or 15 minutes to get things in and out. And you're working. So we worked, the lab was open from 6 a.m. till 10 p.m. And we only, we did eight hour shifts, but that's still a long time and it's still hot and you're not drinking enough and it's stressful. So yeah, I would say get as much experience as possible. Thank you. Just one more question at the back. Thank you, Victoria. This is not a question, actually. Um, I'm Val. I, I'm doing um, international development management. I'm from Sierra Leone. Ah. And I was in Sierra Leone during the Ebola. Um, I just want to thank you and thank all of you for, for the support and the help. Mm. It wasn't easy, we know. I sent my staff um, through the PPE training mm. and they came back saying they didn't want to do it <laughs> because it was so hard. Mm. So I just want to thank you and thank all of you for your time and your effort you. and, and, and just helping us. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, so um, Victoria, that was a brilliant um, talk mm -hmm. you've given us and we really appreciate you coming mm -hmm. and give us a bit of an insight on how you can get into the volunteering process. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, so we will be having a networking um, session, uh, which we, you will talk over drinks um, in a minute, but I have one announcement I have to make. Um, so um, what it takes series will be taking place again on the 2nd of February, and this is what it takes to be LGBTI and proud. And this um, event is in collaboration with the student National Pride to mark the beginning of the LGBTI history. So if you want to attend this, then can you in, um, register? Um, so you can attend the meeting. So I'd like to thank you all for coming along to this um, very informative, exciting talk, and I wish you all the luck if you want to get into the volunteering process and doing your bit to help and aid in a crisis. So thank you so much. Thank you.